This video will coincide with week two, governance and structure. I'd like to talk briefly about the difference in governance between three specific levels, the institutional level, the conference level, and then at the NCAA level. Starting with the institutional level, athletics departments must reflect the ideals of the institution. And each institu institution has their own set of uh, code of ethics and standards that they abide by and that their student athletes um, are required to abide by. Typically, an athletic director will report to the institutional president just to ensure that the athletic department is operating ethically um, and all the operations are sound and um, representing the, the institution well. If we look at specific policies, policies may differ based on what level we're looking at. So let's take, for example, a drug policy for student athletes. UNLV at the institutional local level has its own rules and regulations for drug use among student athletes. Uh, one example would be an athletic department or an institution uh, promotes a signed uh, drug testing consent form. So each year the student athlete has to sign off on a consent that they may be randomly drug tested uh, at that institution. And so that would be a regulation at the institutional level. Now, if we jump ahead to the NCAA level, the NCAA has its own set of operating standards and policies along the lines of similar to what the institution offered, where there's going to be a signed uh, consent form that students may be randomly drug tested each year. They've also implemented another layer of regulations in that at postseason championships, um, student athletes may randomly be asked to conduct urine samples uh, in terms of when they get to that postseason competition level. So these are some of the one example of a difference in regulations between the institution and the NCAA. There's a written code of ethics for each institution and a judicial process that follows if student athletes um, happen to actually break a law, which is different from the NCAA guidelines, which we'll get to. But each institution has their own set of operating procedures. If we look at the conference level, as we have seen through the PowerPoint lesson, that conferences are bound by similar attributes. Some of these attributes can be geographical location. So we want to make sure that the schools within a conference are within a fair travel distance. So we're being mindful of how many classes student athletes might be missing because of travel uh, implications. Or they might be grouped together by likeness or academic rigor. The Big 12 is known to have a very strong academic rigor, and so when they are considering which schools they want to um, include in their conference in terms of expansion, it's essentially a requirement that those schools are at the top tier of uh, research standards. Now, what's happened over the last year or so is the different conferences have branched off, and we have what's known as the Power Five conferences. And so when you think of what are your powerful, big-time sport program athletic conferences, well, the Power Five consists of the ACC, the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big Ten, and the Big 12. And then we have what's called the Group of Five conferences, and those are your other conferences, including the American Athletic Conference, Conference USA, Mid-American Conference, Sun Belt Conference, and the Mountain West Conference. What's happened is the Power Five institutions wanted more autonomy to create their own legislation. Why? Because they have the resources and ability to do that. And so they wanted to lower the voting threshold, essentially what they need uh, to make happen in terms of what they can offer their student athletes. So for example, recently uh, the group Power Five has broken off and has its own autonomy legislation. In order to approve some of these legislations, they only need 60% approval and a majority in three of five conferences, or a simple majority if supported by four of five conferences. Also, what they've done is they've increased the student athlete voice. Each of the five conferences have three voting student athlete reps, so 80 votes in total and nearing close to 20% of that vote comes from the student athlete's voice and what they would like to see happen in some of those autonomy proposals. And an autonomy proposal would be, for example, rules and regulations around transferring to a different institution. And uh, to summarize, the Power Five again wanted to be able to do its own, um, 
and act on its own there. And this could be uh, co raising costs of attendance uh, scholarships or potentially allocating uh, different money for recruiting visits so that they can show student athletes more when they're visiting those campuses. And this has made it even more difficult for that group of five conferences to compete and stay uh, relevant and be able to compete with some of the things that the Power Five conferences are providing. So those are some of the governance and uh, rules and regulations that are occurring at the conference level. Now, if we take it to that final layer, which is the NCAA, there is a board of governors which is comprised of presidents and chancellors from different institutions and they discuss issues that affect the entire membership. I think we're all familiar with that very large NCAA uh, Division I manual which is the official guideline and uh, governing rule book for all policies and procedures and each division has their own set of uh, rules and regulations they must abide by so Division I, II, and three. But essentially the uh, Division I guidelines is comprised of health and well-being, student athlete well-being, uh, mental health, recruiting issues, compliance, academics. So all of these guidelines that can help enforce uh, behavior and conduct at the um, athletic department and local level. One thing that's happened is that sometimes there's uh, classic examples of institutions or athletic departments that have gone beyond the scope of an NCAA rulebook and actually broken a law or a regulatory statute. And so a prime example might be the Penn State uh, case where we had um, a tremendous amount of sexual conduct issues happening um, with minors. And so this is an example of when the law would become involved. Um, this goes beyond the scope of an NCAA rulebook. However, the NCAA did use the, the independent investigation uh, that was conducted to really understand what was happening in Penn State in order to impose their own sanctions on Penn State in terms of the school losing um, the number of wins that they had accumulated and amassed over multiple years and they lost scholarships and they had to donate a certain amount of money in order to repair some of this damage that had been that had taken place uh, at Penn State. And so these are examples of how uh, when the law is broken at a criminal level, how we have different sanctions imposed versus at the NCAA level and their regula regulatory statutes.